I'm going to speak today clearly on something to do with ecosystems and how they grow and how growth-oriented ecosystems help firms grow as well. And uh, is that too loud? No. Um, and one of the outcomes of this, I think, a specific approach to this is that they have a, a broad-based impact. And I think what I hope to do is make clear how exactly that happens. Uh, and so today, um, my 40-some minutes are going to be divided into three parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about why scaling up is necessary. And I know some of you already believe that and think that. What I hope to do is arrive at a language that will help make that happen, because language is important. Uh, I'm going to go through this part of the presentation fairly quickly. Um, so it'll be a little bit breathless in order to spend a little more time on analyzing the, what I call the immediate growth potential. And it's very surprising, some of the data that you'll see um, on the places that you all live and work and want to have an impact on. So I'll go a little bit more slowly, and then hopefully dwell even more on presenting a, a fairly hardened method by now of how to impact regions by region. I mean when I use the word subnational, not multinational, not uh, supranational, supranational. So we're going to go fast for the first third and then slow down. So fasten your seat belts, uh, and um, hopefully you'll, you'll stay awake as well. So back not 10 years ago, I set off with some colleagues of mine. And by the way, yes, I've I've uh, been affiliated with Babson, but I've also been myself an entrepreneur. I'm a very active investor, and I'll mention why that's relevant in a few minutes. And our, our, the challenge we set for ourselves is how to use entrepreneurship as something that people were talking about uh, 10 years ago to, to impact or create foster broad-based prosperity, but do it in such a way so that it's very quick. Can you see that? Can you see the slides? Uh, that's very quick, that it's a consistent methodology, that's a, it, it's, it's self-accelerating, it doesn't require continual outside investment. It's very inexpensive, and that's important too, isn't it? It's not just about, phys it's also about physical resources, but there's also financial resources. It's efficient, and then it applies broadly to, uh, to normal, what I call normal economies. We, we hear these stories and we tell these stories about these mythical places out there, and we think we should be like them. And then it's also measurable. Um, and uh, 10 years later, we have quite a few projects going on. Some of the projects at the bottom are ones that were inspired by the work that we do or the methods. They've come to training uh, in our, with our group. The ones above, we actually manage actively. But, and there's a big, very important but, as usually there is in life, uh, along the way, we, ha we realized very early on that we had to change, change some of our own beliefs about what entrepreneurship is so that it's useful to have an impact on society. Um, and one of, these, one of the things that we learned is that this word that we use, entrepreneurship, it can't mean everything. But we use it for so many different things. And here are just some examples. We use it as a proxy for self-employment or microenterprise or small business, uh, startups, and it goes on and on, innovation, disruption. And of course, I can't leave out. Uh, Unicorns, and hopefully by the end of my talk, a few of you will use that word. You'll understand why you should use that word less. Um, uh, but words, speaking of them, and this I'm going to digress just for two minutes, they're tools. They're tools that we have to get things done. Most of the things we get done in life are done through words. And so they're very important, and it's important to get these right. So this is going to be just the two-minute, maybe even less, I hope, academic pause about the importance of words as tools to get things done. So these are all examples of hammers. It's a hammer to play the piano, and a hammer to shoot a gun, and a hammer in the Olympics, and of course to drive a nail. Uh, but they have very different purposes, and of course you wouldn't want to use a nail to play a piano, or, dr or shoot a gun to play a piano, and certainly want to use, you wouldn't use a gun to drive a nail. That's obvious, correct? Um, yet not all entrepreneurship is useful in driving economies whether, again, self-employment, small business, et cetera. Not all of them are equally beneficial or equally useful, and this is what I'll go into. Um, the second thing that we learn is that it's useful to have an obsessive focus on new growth. What's, what I think you have to add to the SME, you have to put a G in there somewhere, or, or, or very quickly after, uh, that what's important is growth. And what we learned is that we have to change the dialogue from how to grow new firms 
to how to help more and more firms, and particularly local firms, get new growth. And this is a mantra that I'm going to come back to over and over again. It's just a few words. It has massive practical implications in terms of actually benefiting society with entrepreneurship. So remember, more and more local firms getting more and more new growth or more and more rapid growth. And by the way, parenthetically, my hashtag, my, my Twitter handle, I'm one of the first million Twitter users, uh, at D-A-N-I-S-E-N, feel free to follow or to use it as I'm talking. Um, and again, just a little digression around one of the problems is that, that we're our, what I call our, our misleaders, and forgive me, I'm just poking a little fun, but I think it's important because the words our leaders use also have an impact. It's misfocused on three things. It's misfocused on age, size, and I should say sector. By the way, that's also ass. They're misfocused and, and miss the focus on growth. And just examples, and I'm, this is not a political statement at all. This is just a statement of uh, fact. And these are uh, things that our misleaders have told us. I have great respect, by the way, for all the people that I'm going to show and poke fun of. Um, lifeblood. Uh, by the way, I'm adding to this um, uh, the brains, heart, and lungs to my next presentation. Um, by the way, not to be outdone, the, the backbone, it's the heart, it's the uh, lifeblood. Uh, Trudeau just recently said before he was reelected, the backbone and cornerstone of our economies. So, um, so I'm going to present from uh, why, this, why this is problematic. And I'm going to a little bit of reverse order. I'll start with the startups. I'll go to the small businesses. And I'll end with innovation. I'll end this, this first introductory part. So I'm going to uh, try to show why these, why these are problematic in the way we use them for fostering broad-based prosperity. Okay, and I realized along the way, by the way, I'm gonna say bad things about startups. I'm a, I love startups. I'm a very active so-called angel investor. You see the halo on top of my head. I'm an angel. I'm a private investor in small, risky technology firms, very active. I'm also a, an active uh, fund investor. I've been a venture capitalist in one of the largest funds in Israel way back when. I was a co-founder. So, so I know of what I speak. Um, and uh, so let's start with the startups. Uh, and what hasn't worked, as far as we can measure it, and there are a few, few, few examples uh, that are, that are counterexamples, but this is one, and it's very typical. And this is a large amount of money was put into something called Startup New York. Another disclosure, I was an advisor to the White House in the creation 10 years ago of Startup America, which in my view completely failed. Um, the, uh, and they invested in Startup New York, $53 million. And so, of course, with that kind of public investment, you're going to have people coming in you're, to, to audit, see what's the, what's the result of this investment. Why do we make this, this investment? Well, usually it's for jobs, right? That's, that's the justification. And so the auditor of New York came in and found out that after $53 million of investment, they'd created just over 400 jobs. Not my words, their words. And by the way, when you dig in to any, as far as I can tell, with, again, with one or two very interesting and small exceptions, um, when you dig into the data around the impact of these startup programs, you cannot find, just as in Startup America, you cannot find the impact in a measurable form. Certainly not in terms of jobs. So, why are we even interested in, in entrepreneurship? Because we believe that there's a relationship between something about our, our ability at nations, let's say, to be competitive. Uh, and so, of course, one of the, the World Economic Forum publishes its rankings every year. It's an accepted, you can argue about it, measure of compe national competitiveness. And you'd expect there to be a relationship between entrepreneurial activity, as you can measure it. And there's one very accepted measure called GEM. There's also JEDI, and now there's IDE. There's all kinds of measurements. They're pretty much the same. And we'd expect, of course, that the more entrepreneurship you have, the more national competitive you have, that there's a direct relationship. And you're absolutely right that there is a direct and very strong relationship between competitiveness or economic health on the one hand and entrepreneurship. And there's only one problem. That relationship is exactly the opposite of what we would hope. As far as we can measure it, and we can argue about measurement, and I can argue with the best of them. Uh, and then you'd expect, of course, that if you could, I mean, why do we have the startups? We have the startups because that's where the growth companies come from, right? If we don't have startups, we won't have grown-ups. 
So there should be a relationship between entrepreneurial activity and startups on the one hand and grown-ups on the other hand. Uh, so the more of one you have, the more of the other, right? And again, you're absolutely right that there's a direct relationship, but the relationship is exactly the opposite. These are facts. These are not things that I, uh, these are not my opinions. As far as we can measure them, with accepted measurements. This is a Dun & Bradstreet with American Express measuring mid-market size companies. Those states, for example, this is just done in the United States. You have the real high, in terms of measurement startup, States are Florida, Montana, Louisiana, and Wyoming. By the way, that's pretty consistent. They have the most startups. Um, so that's, and we'll come back and we can, these are nuanced, I know I'm making things sound simple. This, these are complex, nuanced conversations, but there's limited time. So let's take a look quickly at small business. I think you know most of these things probably better than I do. If you look at uh, the, the, countries in the OECD, and this is four or five years ago, that have very high numbers of small businesses, in this case nine or fewer, you find Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. If you look at those countries in which where, where you have very small numbers of small businesses, you have UK, Switzerland, and Germany. So you can choose for yourselves which, uh, which economies you want to strive uh, towards. Uh, and then similarly, if you look at, for example, and you can see this in a number of, of ways, if you look at the productivity of small businesses and how th that changes over time, the bigger you are, the more productive you are. It's complicated, but in general, that's a, a fairly strong finding. And small business also, I'm sorry to say this, I know this is an SME, and this is an SME assembly, I feel a little bit bad, but it gets better as we go along. Don't worry. Um, they, they, it's, it's depressing, and then, you know, you, it's, it's happy at the end. Um, they, they, of course, they pay lower. They, they're less security. There are more accidents. They work longer hours. Many of them work second jobs and so on and so forth. And now it's called a side hustle in the United States anyway. Where you go and you drive an Uber. Um, and... and um, so that's small business. And then innovation, rushing forward here, just a couple of words about innovation. Um, there's this idea that small companies are innovative compared to big companies. And big companies should be looking to small companies for the innovativeness. And of course, like anything, there's a grain of truth to that. Um, but if you actually look at, you are sitting in chairs that have been pretty much the same, by the way, for the last 50 or 100 years. Pretty much. If you look at the innovations that we actually use, whether it's Gorilla Glass or Post-its or hybrid cars or even Hello Kitty and so on, most of these innovations are made by larger firms. And so again, don't trust just my opinion about that. Let's go to the data. This is an interesting study to say, okay, well, it's not just about innovation of technical products. It's, there's such a thing called business innovation as well. And some Researchers went out and created an index of transformativeness of the business model. So we talk about innovation in business model. And they ranked 40 companies on, the, on this index. And I went and I said, okay, that's great. I will correlate that index with the age of the companies. Uh, and at best, there's a relationship such that the older you are, the more innovative and trans the more transformative your business model is. Certainly, there's no evidence that the age determines your innovativeness in, in business model. There's, it's, the correlation is zero, really. Um, so old and young are equally transformative, as far as the data show. I'm not talking about the isolated examples. So we have a problem of usefully. It's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of usefully. We want to use entrepreneurship as a tool to accomplish a social objective. There are problems with treating it as a startup, of treating it as having a small business, and treating it as innovation. So, luckily, there's, in my view, an alternative, and I think there's evidence for that because there's actually a fair amount of research that shows, and for some of you who are the more academic side, look up at Glazer and Care showing very, very clearly and very robustly that, at least in the United States, those regions which have vibrant, growing populations of small companies that are growing have longer sustained prosperity 
than those who don't. So the sustain and this is a belief in a, for, on which, which is founded on some, some evidence that prosperity requires local firms, more and more local firms, to grow more and more rapidly. And let's see, first of all, just a little bit of the research in these companies, because now it's uh, fairly well accepted to talk about scale-ups. And this is some of the, the actual findings, empirical findings, of what these companies look like. First of all, they can be in all ages. Companies that get growth can be young, they can be old, they can be very, very old and still get new growth that's sustained. I'm talking about any of the definitions, the common OECD definition or others, of what high growth is. It can happen in all sectors. Age, sector, size, are, they're agnostic in terms of how much growth there is. Um, third, they're financed primarily. This is the reality. Uh, not by equity investors and so-called angels with halos on our heads and, and venture capitalists with horns on our heads once turned somehow into, from halos into horns. Um, it's, it's financed primarily by the customer and then oftentimes by bank credit. That's the reality. Scaling up is episodic. It's not something that once you do it, you keep doing it. As you look at companies, it goes up and down. They get their mojo, they lose their mojo. They get it again and they lose it again. Um, and by the way, very interesting fact based on a very um, robust empirical research, existing firms are with a, a million or more turnover are two to three times as likely to grow than startups are. Surviving startups and surviving small companies, the small companies with a million or so revenue have two to three times the probability of generating another million dollars of revenues in the next three years. It's a, that's a very, in my view, a very important fact. So now what are we talking about? I'll give a few examples of scale-ups. I tried to use European and quasi-European examples, at least partly. Denmark, I don't know. We'll consider you European just for the sake of this conversation. Um, Linac. How many know of uh, Linac out there? Come on, there must be a few of you. Uh, Third generation company, a metalworking shop in Midjuland, where the, the grandfather founded it, the father took it over, six, seven, eight people, until the third generation took it over for interesting reasons and grew it by a thousand people in 10 years. In 10 years, now a leading man the leading manufacturer of these little motors that put hospital beds up and down. If you have a really expensive desk, it goes up and down. Um, employing a lot of people uh, and a global leader. And now we'll go over to Iceland. I just happen to know this because I wrote several cases on a company you've never heard of, probably called Alvagen. Um, fascinating story of a, a, a person, Robert Westman, acquiring 100-year-old assets, combining with some other assets. First year, because they were legacy assets, they had about 37 million euro of sales, and in 10 years grew it to a $1.2 billion company. Not a startup, by the way, took existing assets. By the way, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. Entrepreneurship is not about the age of the asset. It's not about new ideas or new things. It's about infusing value. It's defined by how much value you put into the asset, not how old it is. And this is just another an example. And by the way, now I'll give you a few familiar examples, but what the, what the reality, the historical reality is different from the image and the dialogue we create from them. And this is, of course, Apple. Very interesting. And Stephen Jobs was out for 12 years. You can see he grows older and older and very tragically and sadly passes away from cancer. But look at the performance of the company. Apple, all, all, all of Apple's growth occurred after it was 25 years old. It was a niche sort of up and down bouncy player. A friend of mine tried to buy them for $50 million, right, in one of those glitches. All of it. And I'll give you another, this is a, a, a quiz, and I won't embarrass you, but if you know the answer, shout it out. Who is this company that in the first 10 years of its life, first 10 years of its life, went up and down and up and down and up and down in terms of value? Anybody know? Okay. 
This, by the way, the same company. It's not just value. It's income and revenues and cash flows and everything else. All created after Amazon was 17 years old. All of the value of Amazon was created after it was 17. And by the way, you see that also in non-tech stars, companies. You see it also in media companies. This is one that you all know of. But did you know that Walt Disney grew by almost 1,000 times in the last 10 years now? A thousand times and employs 200,000 people. All the growth, it's 90 years old when it started to grow like crazy. All right? IBM went down, way, way, way down, then Gershner took it over, oh, way, way, way back up. It's gone through a lot of ups and downs. Um, so now let's sort of take a side. I know you have a lot of questions and comments you want to get in there and, and have some discussion and spark. Uh, that's okay. As I said, these are nuanced conversations. Um, Let's, I did sort of a back of the envelope or back of the PowerPoint analysis of using some of these ideas. What is the scaling potential in Europe? So give, let's uh, take the next 10 minutes or so and walk through what this looks like. Um, and this is not a very good map, but it's what I could easily find. And I looked at, it in the, at the union, companies over 10 employees, companies that have passed a minimum market test. They're actually doing some trading, doing some business. And so I use 10 and above or what you would call, I think it's micro enterprise over here, and then it becomes small and then medium, right? Um, does anybody know how many uh, companies there are of this kind in Europe that have passed the 10 mark? Do you, anybody have any what percentage of companies? Sorry? 45%, and you're an optimist. <laughs> what, 10%? I'm gonna shape you until you get the right answer. I looked also, okay. so it's about, it's about, no, it's about 1.7, it's about 7% on the average. But what's also very interesting about that, I don't know if you can read these slides, it, it runs, it's a, it's a, there's a fair range. There's, you have Greece and uh, Czech Republic and Poland, which have very, very, very small big companies, or very, a lot of small micro companies. And you have Germany, Denmark, and Austria, which have 15, 17, 18% of larger SMEs. It's interesting, but let's use that. And then I, what I did is I took four regions or cities for somewhat random reasons, Graz because you were there last year, I'm told, and I took Zealand because I happen to have data on Zealand, some work I did in Denmark, uh, Nice because I gave a speech there once, and Napoli because my wife's from Napoli. So I didn't want to take the big, well-known cities that, you know, everyone, they have, they have, the big cities have everything of everything. So let's, um, and I, so that's the populations. And I tried, to, and then I, I, I used what I call the scale-up rule number one, which is that companies that have passed some minimal market test they have growth potential. We use the rule of thumb somewhere between 10 and 20%. We can argue about why that number, but accept it for now. So assuming that, that if you have over, let's say, a million euro in turnover, about 10 to 20% of you have real growth potential, which is actually a fairly conservative assumption. And that means in these four regions, those are the numbers, it's about, I think, it's about almost 1,500, 1,800 companies uh, in those regions. And now I'll give you scale-up rule number two, which has, again, a little bit of empirical uh, justification for it. A scale-up ecosystem, this is a mouthful, okay? A scale-up ecosystem forms. A culture starts to change, can change. There can be a catch of uh, kind of a, a virality to growth, a contagion to growth, if, if in a relatively, relatively dense region, Every year for about five years, you have one newly scaling company, not new startup, one newly scaling company for about every 100,000 people. So let's use that, that rule and say, okay, in Zealand, that means you need five companies a year that are newly scaling. They're one, $2 million companies, and then they start growing for whatever reason. And Graz needs about 20, 25 companies altogether. And this has to happen, though. If you do, you, if you do it once, then it doesn't catch on. You have to keep doing it. And let's say five years you do it. This is how many companies you need 
newly scaling companies in Zealand, in Graz, in Nice, and Napoli, in order for to catch on and to change things. It's not enough you just have that. You have to do other things. Uh, and then I calculated what I call the surplus. And this is a little bit geeky. You may not get it. It's OK. But this is my attempt to say, well, do you have, in order to reach this tipping point, do you have that stock of companies already there? And what this says is that these four regions have between 7 to 20 times the stock of companies already existing, already existing, to enter into a growth, to have growth really catch on and become contagious. I'm going to just show you this. I'm not going to walk you through it because you'll either get it or you don't. And I'm happy to give you these slides. It's, it's not, it's not, this is not higher mathematics. There are 25 million firms in Europe. There's about 7% of them have over a million, which is 1.7. 20% have growth potential. That's how I get the 340,000 number. Assume about 2 million on the average, 2 million a year of turnover. And that means that you have about 680 million euro right now, roughly, of latent immediate growth potential in Europe. Immediate growth potential. And then if you assume a modest 10% growth, that's 60 to 100 billion dollars a year that's of latent growth. And it's immediately tappable. Immediately. So what's this guy been smoking? And how does this happen? It sounds too easy. By the way, everything I'm going to say is not easy. It's simple, but, but difficult. It's, it's difficult, but it's straightforward. So I'll spend the, the next 15 minutes that I have or so. Maybe, there may even be a few minutes for, for comments. Is this just total dope smoking? Um, and so I'm going to now walk you through a methodology that we've been using to actually make this happen. And I'm going to go into it here and there in a little bit of detail, just to show you that I think, I believe, that the, we know now, we know, I couldn't say this three years ago, we know now what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for this kind of growth to happen and create what I call a scale-up ecosystem or an environment that encourages and generates more and more local firms growing more and more rapidly. And... It's, also, it's always important to say, what does it cost and can it be self-sustaining? Uh, and again, well, I already told you this. Uh, there are four pillars, four necessary and sufficient conditions for this kind of ecosystem to form. One is that you demonstrate growth quickly. You demonstrate that growth can happen quickly here at home. Secondly, it's not enough to do it. You have to talk about it. It has to catch on. It has to infect other people. Three, the non-business owners, non-entrepreneurs, they have a role to play as well. And you have to engage them in a certain way for there to really be an ecosystem. And then fourthly, that has to become sustainable. And I'm going to go into each one of these four pillars just to show you what they are. This is 10 years of practice and mistakes and learnings and all kinds of things compressed into a few minutes. So what does it mean to demonstrate that growth um, happens quickly? We created something we call the Scalarator, which has one and only one goal. This is like a training program um, that every participating venture will grow by 25% or a million dollars, whichever is greater in 12 months. You can call that growth hacking if you want. Some facts, we've now done this 20 times in five vastly different economies. Over 300 companies, you can see the outcomes here. Um, they're, they're consistently, consistently uh, gro generating growth. The important thing I want to show here is that 75% have immediate growth events, and about half of them within a couple of years double their growth. It's not one out of 10 that's growing. It's most of them are growing. In fact, almost all of them are showing new growth, and that's very important. And this is, uh, it's made up, these are the components uh, of the scalarator. Again, just to show you, this is not rocket science. It's very simple stuff. It's just like, like fitness training. It's hard to do. We all know what we need to do. It. It's just hard. And by the way, those little yellow things on the, on the outer, outer side of this picture are very important because those are the growth events that are happening all the time and being communicated, the little growth events, which I'll explain what those are. 
this is what it looks like, not very shocking. There's a difference between teaching and learning. There's more learning than teaching that's going on. Doesn't look like your typical classroom. Here there's lots of learning happening and no teaching whatsoever, even better. The scale rater is based on three very simple, what I call the three C's, which is customers, capacity, and cash. And we drill over and over and over again on what do you do about customers, how do you get sales. By the way, sales, I don't know if it is in Europe. In the United States, sales is a dirty word. I taught at the Harvard Business School for 11 years. Do you know how many, and there are 200 full-time faculty. Do you know how many faculty teach sales? The Harvard Business, it's called the Business School. Harvard Business School. Do you know how many sales faculty there are? They recently, you're, you're, you're good, you're an outlier. You're, you're like. It's the same everywhere, everywhere. And Harvard Business School is one and now it's two out of teaching. This, I have to show you this example. I hope you can hear it. This is a short video of one of our participants. Hi, Maurice Zendel, the CEO of OSN. We do hospital revenue cycle management. How big are you? This year we'll do 10 million. So what, uh, you participated in the scalator program t two years ago? Um, what did it do for you? Uh, it, I've been a, uh, Always think has been around for 23 years, and I thought I knew how to run a company. What Scalarator did in a very small investment of my time realigned my entire management field, my management team. Um, just brought us focus and got us to where we needed to go. So other people participated with you in the Scalarator session, some of them? Yes, a couple of my senior leaders in there. And um, how has that impacted your growth? We have doubled since going through the Scalarator. Um, I'm a CEO of a $10 million company. My time is my scarcest and most valuable resource. Why is it worth my time to participate in, in the Scalarator program? Uh, those were the exact same words when I went through this process, and I can tell you I doubled my sales in two years. That should be answer enough. Now, this is a, was a 20-year-old company. Five million dollars of revenues, doesn't matter what they do, five million dollars of revenues, in two years added five million dollars to their top line, and they did it profitably. And just imagine the impact that that has, that one, one example of growth, which is repeated in all the cohort, around all the different cohorts, over and over and over again. These are just some typical examples of outcomes. They're not huge numbers but they're numbers that occur within six to 10 months. So for example, 60 new hires, no big deal, but if you do that 100 times, it becomes a big deal. Uh, this is a cohort we just finished in Canada, in the, North, in the Atlantic Canada, four provinces in the Northeast. Total growth, 11 million Canadian, three million median growth. That means, what that means, three million median is very important. It means most of the companies are growing. Not just one. Important. It's not selective. And that's, that's intentional. It's as unselective as possible. Because the purpose of the scalarator isn't to identify those companies that are going to be smashed out of the park. It's to show that growth is normal and growth is achievable by normal companies. It's not by dealing with the outliers that you get change. It's by dealing with the normal companies that you get change. So the second pillar is communicating growth. And you all know the conundrum. You know the conundrum about the, the tree that falls in the forest and uh, nobody, if nobody around, uh, no, does it make a sound? Well, growth is, is similar. If one company is growing in a given location and nobody knows about it, it doesn't have as much impact as it could as if others knew about it. So there's good and there's bad news about communicating growth. And I'll start with the bad news. The bottom line of the bad news is nobody does it for lots of different reasons, even though it's all over the place. One is we haven't learned what it looks like. We haven't learned why it's important. We haven't learned how to do it. And we haven't created the norms, the social norms, that say that it is important to grow. 
And here what I'm going to do in this next slide is just break down growth into its very small components, examples, very small components. For example, in terms of customers, it's new contracts, it's new customers, new sales, new exports, new memorandum of understanding, new partnerships, new what we call OEM agreements. These are all specific examples of growth events in that particular scene. Or if you look at, for example, building capacity, it's new hires. Two, three, four, five, two hundred new hires. That's growth. New skills, new facilities, new equipment. That's growth in capacity. And growth in cash is better cash cycles, better new investments of all kinds, new public finance. What growth doesn't look like is this. Let me remind you what unicorns are. And I know you use the word. I don't mean to out you or shame you or anything. I use the term as well. But public leaders should absolutely ban the term unicorn from their, their vocabulary, not just because they're mythological. Let me explain. They're based, they're, by definition, they're paper value. By definition. By definition, they're dependent on investors. By definition, they're driven by the possibility of exit which means, by the way, that a few people are going to be making a lot of money. Now, unicorns, I said, ban it from the public discourse. It doesn't mean that I, as a private investor, think that unicorns are bad. I think they're great. They're great. They're a market phenomenon. They should remain a market phenomenon, but that doesn't mean they should be the stuff of policy. We get confused. They also intrinsically, because they put wealth in the hands of a few, they are intrinsically correlated with inequality of both wealth and income. And so it's not enough to just complain about what people are doing. By the way, this I just saw the other day. For those of you who are, I hope you'll appreciate that I can at least copy French. Um, so it's not enough to just complain about what people are saying. You have to come up with alternatives. And I think at least a reasonable alternative, which conveys what we need, conveys what will really make small businesses the heart, the brain, the lungs, the legs, a backbone of your economy, is are the workhorses. Because the workhorses, are, are, they're disciplined by the markets, by customers, what they want. They strengthen, intrinsically strengthen local, local supply chains. Because they are local, they buy, everyone who's local wants to buy local. They broaden them because as they grow, they buy more and more things, services and supplies. And that, it smooths out, doesn't obliterate, nor should it. It, doesn't, it smooths out inequality of all kinds. This is the law of 17. I don't know if you can see it. That says 17 by 17 by 17. It's easy to remember. If you grow by 17%, Day in, day out, day in, day out. You know, you're plowing that. And that's, by the way, I've been an entrepreneur. I built and ran a company for 15 years. That's what entrepreneurship is like. It's day in and day out. One crisis over here, one crisis. Your plow gets stuck on a stone. You, you know, get a flat. That's what it's really like. You grow by 17%. For 17 years, you're 17 times bigger. Not very sexy, but it's what makes economies work. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly just to get to the end. These are all the reasons. You can read them yourselves why we don't communicate about growth. It makes us seem immodest, whether it's the law of Yante in Scandinavia and Denmark and other places, or whether it's I'm going to get investigated by the tax authorities. There are lots of excuses for not talking about growth. It's an unnatural act. Everywhere in the world, it's an unnatural that I've encountered so far. It's not something that happens naturally. I already told you about this, but there's also good news about communicating growth. And the main good news is that we can learn how to do it. It's very easy to learn how to do it if you know what it is. I'll tell you a story, this is a true fish story, that will illustrate why there's nothing like communicating growth. I go fishing a lot, which means waking up early in the morning and going out in my boat and sitting there not catching fish and wondering, should I keep not catching fish? Or should I go home like a normal person and have some coffee and whatever, take a shower and go back to bed? You're always trying to decide, are there going to be any fish here? And what changes the calculus immediately, because we're nosy people, a boat appears, and the person next to me over there 
catches a fish. And I see it because I'm looking to see if they're catching fish. Do you think I go home when I see my neighbor catching a fish? The calculus of investment changes completely, and I stay. And I can tell you, there's only one time I've never, ever caught a fish. One time. That's when I didn't know fishing. <laughs> I'm going to skip over it. Communicating growth has many benefits for the stakeholders and also for the entrepreneurs. It's good to be seen as a winner. It's good to be seen as a growing company. It helps your employees. It helps get new talent. It helps get investment. It helps get support of all kinds. So I'll skip that. I'm going to skip this as well. But I do want to show you, these are two short examples just to show you what growth looks like in, in the small. My commitment to Scalarator has resulted in the hiring of 12 new employees, $1.2 million in new revenue in the year 2018, and I will have purchased two new pieces of equipment which will set me up for even more growth in 2019. Not very sexy. They're not a very interesting company either, but they're growing. That's, that's sexy. I'm the underdog here. All right, I'm Frank from Bruce City Brand Apparel. We are a Milwaukee-based family clothing. business with over 30 years of experience developing products for the retail marketplace. And since joining Skip, some amazing things have happened to us. Our sales have been up by about $250,000. <laughs> and 2016 was our best year uh, on record in our 31 years. We I'm going to skip and ditch with that. Just imagine that happening hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in that community. It, it makes an impact. I'm going to skip because I don't, I'm running out of time. Uh, let me mention a word about engaging stakeholders. Uh, I'm, if you Google entrepreneurship ecosystem, I'm the person to blame for you using a word that is likely to be misspelled. Um, about 10 years ago, I popularized the term entrepreneurship ecosystem. Unfortunately, it's come to mean something very different. Uh, this is a cartoon or sort of a, a conceptual frame of what an ecosystem is. It's not just the incubate, the hardware, the incubators and co-working spaces and angel networks. It's the culture. It's the engagement of many, many actors. That's what forms an ecosystem. And they can be engaged systematically for their own benefit. Not, for, not to help small companies, SMEs, grow. They're engaged because it helps them enrich their supply chains or it helps them be innovative or it helps them acquire new markets or talent. So the importance of engaging stakeholders, you have to do it by engaging their motivations and not yours. The message here is that, that ecosystems are made up of people, people. And the individual people make a difference. It's who you are and how you talk to each other that makes the difference. It's not policy makers, it's specific individuals. The fourth pillar of sustainability, that's building a structure so that it keeps going and keeps going and keeps getting bigger and bigger. These are two examples of outcomes from projects that we've done. You can't read that, but you can read this. Manizales Mas, a small city of Normal, normal city, all the normal problems, half a million people. It, because they took this seriously, it has completely changed the trajectory of the city. Young people come back. Companies are moving there. Entrepreneurs are setting up shop there. The academics are publishing books on entrepreneurship that they never published before. They're number one in Colombia now in pride in their city and sense of opportunity because they took ecosystems seriously. And by the way, it's not just about the, the hard measurements, you can also see it in the soft measurements. That's what it feels like. If they would turn up the volume. Those are people celebrating their own growth in their own communities. So this tested methodology I think now we can be relatively confident that its broad applicability has one core goal, more and more local firms growing more and more rapidly. It's important to practice the language 
of success, to practice the language of growth, to practice the language of scale. You can do it. It's not complicated. You have to practice. It's hard. This is just an advertisement. We teach about all of this once a year at Babson in a three-day program. You're invited to come. But hurry up, because scale-up is taking off. This is a plane that is actually leaving the ground. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Scale up now.